Good evening, Bill Woodman. Good evening, Sandy. How are you? I'm fine. Um, before we begin, I do want to just mention that uh, one of the images this evening is graphic uh, depiction of death and violence. So some people might not want to face that. And this evening I've called our presentation The Hawk, um, really thinking about hawkish, something that's aggressive, warlike. Um, the definition being, I think, warlike, especially about foreign affairs, which is, I, I didn't realize that kind of additional aspect to that word hawkish. Oh, that's a big thing in America. Mm. Uh, anyway, yes, uh, so we will be talking about war, effects of war, how we see war through depictions of war. And so the first slide, when I put it up, um, I will also give another warning before I put it on the screen, uh, is, is an image that some people might find distressing. Yep. Um, do you consider yourself to have lived at a time of war? Um, there have been many wars in my lifetime, mm. uh, although I would not consider myself to have lived through a time of war since despite the fact that trillions of dollars were spent on wars, arguably in my name, in my lifetime, I was not involved in them. Yeah. Yeah. I have a very strange sort of feeling about it really, because, um, I grew up in a, a family home where there was still a celebration, a kind of cult-like following of, especially men, and sort of my grandparents' generation, men who had been to war. Especially World War II, probably. Yeah, so, um, you know, photographs. In fact, I even have a photograph here, not for this reason, just it's a lovely photograph of my grandfather, but a photograph of my grandfather in his naval uniform. Mm. Um, which, you know, is a, a sort of standard image, I guess, for anyone who's, whose relative has, you know, been in the services and the armed forces to have a photograph of somebody in their uniform. But it, it really was a kind of, um, and some people will think quite rightly, uh, a, a cause for um, respect, if not celebration. Yep. Um, but yeah, so in the sense that I would hear my grandparents talking about the war and, and what happened to them in the war, how they lived their lives and, and the, the sort of the general fallout in their personal lives from that situation. Uh, I don't feel that I can, thankfully, I can't say that I have lived through a war, yet like you, I acknowledge that I have lived through a time of war and actually, as we speak now, there is war raging uh, somewhere on the planet. Yes, but that's probably been true for the last 5,000 years straight and will always be true. Right. So I think that is a, a, a thing to, to, to talk about or go into a little bit, is that do we think that humans can ever not be at war? Humans are animals. We're awful. We have adrenaline and greed and fear. And some of those people will always start violent conflict and other people will have, in my opinion, sadly, frustratingly so, very little choice as to stop them with also violent means. You know, it's it's like one of those things where I said, well, you know, what somebody's hitting you, just walk away. It's like, well, in the global world, you can't do that. So... You end up in these situations where it's like the least bad of two terrible options. Um, or at least I think that that's how people should philosophically end up on it. You know, I don't think there's many people who are actually pro-war. No, yet none of us seems to resolve the war really with you know within ourselves you know we're at, we're at sure. war with ourselves anyway we're sure. at war in small scale every day of our lives from honking the horn in the car to um you know feeling anger towards sure. somebody else yeah. i um, mean you, you live in a corner of the world where there's still 
you know, animosity between Catholics and Protestants and, you know what I mean? All this kind of stuff. Right. So. Yeah. I mean, we don't seem to be able to get by. Yeah. Without conflict. It's, yep. it's hardwired somehow into us. And there's lots of things that I read or listen to, particularly uh, in the teachings of Krishnamurti, for example, that really kind of goes into this idea that, you know, we are at war within ourselves and um, I am just going to read it. It's from The First and Last Freedom by Krishnamurti. Uh, war is a spectacular and bloody projection of our everyday life. It is an outward expression of our inward state and enlargement of our daily action. True. Um, I do wonder, though, about these sort of um, facts, the facts of of war you know almost like is can there be such a thing as a fact of war the fact of war is death that's the ultimate fact sure but the the rationale of war is often so muddied or grayed by um context circumstance but the rationale i think ultimately frustratingly again is probably some sort of life right it's like I think that I need to do this in order so that I can live. I wonder if that's people at a grassroots level thinking that way. I do wonder about the greater machine that the, the, the hierarchy, the top of the table, well, whether they think about, can I live or more, can I accumulate? Sure. But that goes for all sides of war, right? You know, I mean, it's, the thing is, is that as, you know, as a percentage of population of the world since World War II, there's actually been less and less and less people killed in war each year. War is actually down from what it was 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Mm. So it's like, maybe we are making progress. I don't know. Anyway. I think the problem, the thing is, that we see it more now. You know, it's more, it, you know, the... 150 years ago, you did not see photographs of dead people at a war. You know, you would you would see triumphant paintings of people at war, but very rarely were you seeing, you know, this is what's happening over there. Well, I mean, we are actually going to look at one of the most famous photographs from 100 and nearly 70 years. 70 years ago, but there's no people in it. No, that doesn't mean that Fenton didn't photograph people. We will come to that in a minute. I do just want to mention before I turn over or push the button uh, that the image coming is some people will find distressing. So yep. uh, if you don't want to look at that, then now is the time to stop. Okay, so. We're starting in Vietnam. Yeah. So this is classed as one of the kind of greatest anti-Vietnam War posters. Sure. Um, there's lots of things about it. You know, it's a very, um, sometimes Wikipedia is crap. Other times it's really, really informative. The Wikipedia information about this, I know it's not the only information about this. There's lots actually that you can look up. There's so many offshoots from the sort of story that surrounds this. But anyway, the original photograph was by Ronald L. Um, Haverhill, uh, and he was a combat photographer working for the US military. And he made this photograph in 1968. Um, it is a photograph of slaughtered um, South Vietnamese women and children, babies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's from the My Lai Massacre. Now, yeah. I, I know very little about that. Um, I don't fully understand the context particularly well, even of the Vietnam War. Well, I think than... that's, that's a 10 part podcast series alone, but yes. Right. So it, it's something that I don't want to speak to as if I, I, know, <laughs> as if I know anything really ab about it, other than I know that as much as I can, people in the States were, were, often against the Vietnam War and they could feel rather helpless about why their country should sort of push forward and that there are lots of connected social um, injustices really both overseas in Vietnam but also at home in the States that were kind of highlighted 
by that particular conflict. Yes, but they were all, in my opinion, all those things are also separate things as opposed and and one big thing all together. You know, right. one is not, it's easy to confuse them. I yeah. know that. But anyway, this uh, photograph is actually taken on his own camera, so it wasn't taken on the on the official. Uh, US military issue camera. This was taken on his personal camera. So it, I think it was rather a surprise that it started to then suddenly circulate very publicly because 50,000 copies, someone got hold of it. 50,000 copies uh, were printed and distributed around the US. Yep. Um, and actually, there's a connection to MoMA, which is that um, originally uh, the AWC, the Art Workers Coalition, uh, who launched this, at least two of the people who belonged to that coalition were either worked at, worked for, or were somehow connected to MoMA. And that MoMA originally had agreed to fund the poster. And at the last minute, because of conflicts within its own uh, political agenda, um, the funding was pulled and nonetheless the AWC managed to get these 50,000 copies printed by the Lithographers Union in New York City, basically. Okay. Uh, anyway, the text comes from an interview that was on national television, by all accounts, with a soldier who was part of this massacre. The interviewer said, and babies? And apparently the soldier glibly, and babies. Yep. Just to affirm that, you know, these are the bodies of women and dead children. Yep. And why they're partially closed, one can wonder at. Why they've been massacred, one can wonder at. Why they've been dumped like this, one can wonder at. It, I mean, to me, I'm looking at you, Bill. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking at the screen. I've seen this image many times over and I've scrutinized it. Um, by the way, if you do find out more, anybody watching, listening, if you, if you look at the original photographer, he is, you know, this is his his one shot shot. Uh, the original photograph is even more stark than this one. This one has a kind of um, layer of color over it that somehow seems to distance it just a little bit from me. The original photograph, you really can go into it, shall we say. And sure. uh, I wonder what it brings up for you. Are we, am I speaking as as an American male? Am I speaking as from a, from what point of view? From my personal point of view? Hang on, wait. You are an American male, aren't you? Yes, but I mean, I definitely don't think that I speak for your average American male. Well, um, do we not only ever speak for ourselves? Well, it depends who you talk to, but yes, I mean, I tend to you think also that. are an American male, Bill. There's no getting around that. I don't think. True, it's true. Right. I'm very American. Um, what I think about this kind of stuff, I, this particular image, I think this is the aftermath of this is what happens when you put gu guns and power and death in the hands of kids and ship them around the other side of the world and make them really, really scared. Is, is what I think it is. And right. I think that I am not surprised that this happens. Uh, you know, in any war, I think you can find things like this on all sides, right? You know, atrocities and terrible things. Yeah. Um, I think that they are used politically by the other side in order to show how terrible the other person is and dehumanize both the aggressor and the victim in some way, right? You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure there are were pro American war in Vietnam. People were looking like who would look at a picture like this and say, see, you know, they, they must've thought these people were crazy commies or, you know, whatever terrible thing. 
And then there's other people who say, see, these American servicemen, they're nothing but these men who just want to slaughter people for no good reason, and they don't understand humanity and all these sort of extreme opinions on what is ultimately just a really tragic, terrible situation. Um, you're being one thing evasive. That I, Sorry, you're being evasive. I, I want I want to really go into this. Well, I, I, don't, no, I, don't, I don't want you just to try and furnish an idea. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm setting that up so that when I say other stuff, I don't come out as like thinking that that's all I'm thinking. Okay. When I look at this kind of stuff, I personally generally think, yes, of course this happens. Yeah, it happens all the time. It happened today. I'm sure this many people were slaughtered today in a number of different places in the world by terrible people who wanted power or freedom or money or to stop the other guy or whatever, right? Wait, wait, sorry, I have to interject there because yep. it is something that I'm sure it would come up again. But terrible people. I wonder about that. You said something already. Whether these people are terrible. Yeah, you said something already that kind of dispels that, which is this is what happens when you scare the shit out of Sure. A bunch of kids. Hmm. You know. Like this um, is not to in any way justify or condone this as the result. No. But of I mean, but I guess what I'm saying, that's exactly what I mean, is that terrible people is in is in sort of not scare quotes, but is in, you know, it's like, yeah, this is this is humanity does this kind of thing. It does this kind of thing all the time. Mm. Um, the fact that we are seeing very visceral proof of it. I think, you know, it's, I mean, even COVID still killing 3000 people a day. If you stuck a pile of 3000 bodies in front of somebody and took a picture of it, people would go, Oh my God. But somehow in their brain, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, we're not good at thinking about the actual problems in this world. Like we're not good at quantifying things. We're not good at seeing pain and suffering. We're, or rather we're very good at out of sight, out of mind. Right. And, and these people, especially for Americans, for a lot of Americans who maybe were or were not moved by this, it's like, well, those are people way over there in Southeast Asia. Those aren't my kids and my wife and whatever it is. Or they might say, look, those women and kids are just like your kids and my kids. It's, it's, I think photographs like this are fascinating because they show truth, which is that human beings can be awful while simon simultaneously not actually being able to do anything to stop it next time i mean look this picture was taken in 1968 yeah that war there was no peace deal until 1972 or 73 mm -hmm. for another four or five years people were slaughtering each other just like this and you know what we don't see we don't see the 4 million bombs that were dropped in Cambodia in the last years of the war, whatever it is that killed, who knows how many thousands of times this many people. I, I'm not sure though, whether, I, I don't know. Could you ex explain why that's relevant just for a minute? Because- Well, I'm, I'm just saying that it's interesting that, that, that we sometimes, we put more importance, importance, more weight on there were actual people on the ground with guns who shot these people, right? This is how they died. Mm -hmm. Somehow, if one person in an airplane dropped a single bomb and killed this many people, it wouldn't, it wouldn't feel as, I don't know that it would, it would have the same, people would have the same visceral reaction to it. And it's just, I guess we're just, you know, one person dies, a thousand people die, a million people die. It's a statistic, right? The classic Hitler quote, you know, um, it's, 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 this is just enough people for our human brains to say, oh my God, that's 35 people and they're all dead and it's women and children and innocents and look at the terrible things that are happening. And it's like, yeah, millions of people died in that war, mostly. So, so then the question more is, you know, is this a just use of the image?
Ye yes, because I think all people should be sort of generally anti-war. Not that I think that you can do away with all war, but I also think that it's very manipulative, purposefully so, right? That's the whole, that's the whole point of this. It, it is, but then one would say, you know, here are the bodies of women and children. And do you know what? Forget about it. And being women and children, that it is women and children, yeah. makes it more horrifying. For right. Here's the body of innocent non-combatants who were, who were shot, or non-combatants right. that were so shot. If right? you're looking at a pile of soldiers, sure. you know, we would maybe, maybe feel differently. We would still perhaps mourn their loss sure. if they looked like us for example because we're yep. horribly separative and uh but I'm, but I'm sure somebody really far to the right in america at that time would also say well you know what it's good it's better them than us because if khrushchev has his way and communism takes over the world your wife and daughter are going to get killed because stalin killed 20 million people during his purges and and all this kind of stuff you know that that you i mean it's sort of a better them than us kind of mentality, right? Right. Um, it, 50, again, 50,000 printed in the first run of this. Yeah. So the AWC got hold of this image. I'd like to investigate more actually how that happened. But anyway, the AWC got hold of it. They, they worked with the lithographers union in New York. They fired it out. If people in, you know, from MoMA who were well connected, by the way, um, the same group, one of them was a man called Tony Shafrazi. Shafrazi. I don't know him, but I'd also say that, you know, all the people who worked at organizations like that were all crazy, well-educated, elitist, rich people probably at the time too, right? I'm just saying it's not like this was like an actual grassroots, you know, mom in Iowa City kind of thing. It was a bunch of people who were involved at the top levels of New York liberal society trying to, you know, change the world in their opinion for the better, right? Um, everybody's got an angle, I guess, is my point. It's interesting. Go ahead. Do you disagree? I'm letting what you just said settle in me a minute because I think it's agitating me. Why? I accept that people have their privileges mm -hmm. and it creates their agenda. Mm -hmm. But I wonder when their agenda has the purpose of peacefulness, it's the same agenda. No yes, but I, I bet you the percentage of people in that class whose kids actually went to this war was a lot lower than, you know, the kids down the block. But this is very park. interesting, though, in the context of something we, we have talked about privately that we shall not discuss in public. But I just want to mention in terms of being woke, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, um, I think that there's a grave problem with people being disallowed somehow from contributing somehow from contributing to movements of goodness or things that are righteous for example just because of their perceived privilege within a wider social strata i agree but i also think that just because you uh, try to advance what are generally considered righteous goals that does not in itself make you righteous. No, indeed. But also the other thing I, I would like to just sort of qualify also my, my personal thought on this is that anything that has an agenda cannot be good. And um, in that things that seek to, to um, essentially control the movement of something is actually in itself an act of violence. So that's very interesting to me and that's very subtle and it's something that would be very difficult for us to talk about now well. Yeah. But I would I would like us to think about it and if anybody well, listening or watching might like to really look at this in themselves as well, you know, that 
we say we want to have peace. Yep. The very fact that we so desire it makes us a danger. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And and do you think that the the families of all these dead people really give a crap whether a bunch of Americans who were trying to stop the war were also the ones who had their kids get out of going to the war and all this kind of nonsense, right? Um I, I don't know. It is it is it all of these things are so it's just like the biggest lasagna in history, right? It's just like, it's so multi-layered and multifaceted and inter acting weights and, and, and privilege and purpose. And it's complicated, I guess is what I'm saying. And you're also looking at this in its time. If somebody took this picture from 1968 and put the text over it in today say right and said look we did this in 1968 we slaughtered all these people now there's all these people getting slaughtered in the U in ukraine right now mm -hmm. you know is is this is this now history or is this universal well i think images such as this raise questions about our ability to be universal in that exactly okay. what we're talking about already this notion that you know we move together as one for peace for example sure if there's even one person that does not move with us then we are all committing acts of violence yes i mean i understand what you're saying yeah yeah um it's very sneaky because also i wonder about the kind of mechanics of my own capabilities you know mm -hmm. a standard thing for a parent to question is if my child were threatened would I fight for them right how far am I pushed before I act yep. and how far will you go and how, how far will I go and then the connected questions being that you know if I love you will I save you and at what costs? And if you love me, would I push you to rescue me? Yep. Um, and these are impossible questions. Thank and, 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 what, and what are the limits? You know, am I willing to kill a billion people in order to save you? You know, mm -hmm. like, well, obviously that's absurd. Yeah. You know, but so, I mean, like, okay, what if it's three people I need to kill in order to save you? Well, uh, I know. I mean, this know. is, this is like, you know, ninth grade morality philosophy. trolley problem stuff. <laughs> yeah. Up the wazoo. Um, but anyway, just thinking for a moment, if we can, about image now as an image, what's the role of the photograph in propaganda does is does does this does the type on this photograph drastically change the meaning of this um i think so i think also the type itself the font of it was from the new york times yeah it looks uh, like a, a, a times, why, yeah. Yeah. yeah like a times new roman font yeah. but it was specifically from the times and i don't know if the interview that it was on cbs or something uh was then transcribed in the times but there's some reason why it looks like this and obviously it, oh is it actually it. like oh you know this could actually be a sort of like a, a magnified up version of the actual type that was in print it could be yeah and it's it's um it's blood red you know it and right, it also right. there's the kind of wash of red over the image like i said if you go onto the wikipedia page about this about yeah. and babies uh which is the title that the art workers coalition gave to it as a release uh, for the poster, and you follow the link that takes you to Ronald L. Haber, and you see the original image, which, as I said, is in, in some it's even more graphic uh, because yeah. it doesn't have that wash of red over it. But the wash of red obviously is designed to get us to think about blood and this. Well, and to get you to think about it, but also to to manipulate you towards oh my god, which 
in, in, in some ways I would look at, if you had two of them next to each other, I would say that the original photograph probably stands as a better object of God war is awful than the one that has type on it. Mm. For, for me, just because it's like, you know what? This isn't somebody trying to manipulate me. This is just a photograph of a bunch of dead people from war. You know, no one's saying anything about it. There's no commentary. There's no whatever. It doesn't need it. You know, there's an argument to be made. I mean, this is like a relief, right? I can actually look at the screen without feeling sure. like a vomit. However. <laughs> have you read the book no. about this? The, the, no, I okay. thought you might have, though. I have. Yeah. So even though this place is not strewn with bodies. Yeah. And even though we're not met with the kind of chromatic horror of death, mm -hmm. this extremely quiet photograph is a place of death, of devastation, sure. rather than the shadow of death. So Fenton, Bill, I'm sure you'll be able to talk a lot more than I about this, but from what little I know, in the Crimean War, Fenton, uh, probably the first known war photographer, I suppose, traveled with- one Generally guy. considered some of like the first photographs of actual battlefields, yeah. Yeah, so he went with one other person, I think in some kind of wagon. Well, you had to, because you had to process the images on the plates right then and yeah, there. Yeah, but um, anyway, this is the trench between Russian and British soldiers. The kind of and there's a there's gun. a nearly identical photograph with the cannonballs gone, mm. um, and some people were wondering whether it was taken. There was an argument of whether it was taken before the cannonballs got there or after the cannonballs were taken and recycled because they could be used again. Do you know and the thing I find fascinating about this? is that by all accounts, Fenton could travel relatively unscathed through all this landscape. Um, and others did too. Tourists would come. Sure. War was different then. Even then. I mean, whilst war was happening. <laughs> oh, the, the, the first battles of the Civil War at Manassas, there were people who came and brought lunch. Yeah. You told me about this before. We've talked about this very recently. Messed up. I mean, I think it's also at a time when people didn't quite, maybe didn't quite realize how awful war actually was, right? And part of that is due to the media and art representation and propaganda of war, your average person didn't quite understand what it meant, you know? I don't know. I mean, I remember, I do want to talk about this in, in comparison actually to our previous image, but I also just want to say that um, early photographs that I saw that were very old, were actually of death. You know, the, the actual study of photography, when I looked at old photographs, I remember being mesmerized by particularly the photographs. It's a very famous photograph, though it's unknown photographer, and it's of the dead communards. Sure. Um, and yeah. these young men, mustachioed young men, lined up in their kind of makeshift coffins with loincloths hastily yeah. slung over their private parts, their eyes kind of, you know, I, I really poured over that photograph and it might sound macabre and odd. I did the same with the previous image as well. When I first ever saw that image, I spent such a long time looking at it. At first with just absolute repulsion and then eventually just to almost try and come to terms with it. Um, but I, I do think that there was, I mean, early photography did often photograph. Sure. I think that the photographs you're talking about were actually like 15 or 20 years after this, but still, I mean, there is a, or, I mean, certainly the pictures Brady took in Civil War, U.S. Civil War are, you know, classic, uh, you know, dead people with rifles still in hand and whatever it is. But I think your average person did not expect to actually watch people with their legs blown off screaming as they crawled across a battlefield, you know. Um, Do you think, though, that we've had to, with the kind of burgeoning 
multimedia. So mm -hmm. across film and television, like the landscape of how we think and feel has changed completely because we think we know what things are like more now because we see yeah. them in live action, blah, blah, blah. But is that why, you know, I wonder how, it, what way around it happens. Is it because we're informed so well that we must see more? In that, in 1855, when this plate was exposed and the prints were shipped back to London, was this enough to, to enable those seeing sure. to really see what war was? Well, you know, I think about it this way. I mean, you were alive in, say, the early 90s in London. You know what it was like in early 90s in London, right? I, I can see photographs of the early 90s in London. I can show them to my little sister who's 20 years old. She wasn't alive for another 15 years or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But you and I can look at them, and yeah, it looks like it looked when you were there, and yeah, you could imagine yourself there. But if you hadn't been there, is it really a good representation of how it is? Or is it a, you know, I, I, I look at, I've been looking at a lot of photographs from the 1980s in New York here, you know, and you're just like, wow, I've been in, I was in New York in the 1980s and yeah, it kind of felt like that, but I don't think if I hadn't been there that that photograph would do a good job representing what it really felt like. I so, don't know, are you telling me that New York wasn't like a Merowitz photograph? Yeah. Well, <laughs> actually it might've been down on Fifth Avenue, but I, you know, I, whenever I see things like these Fenton photographs or the Brady photographs from Civil War or something, and I think, you know, this is the best we have of what it was like back then, right, is, is writings by people in these photographs. But that doesn't actually tell me what it was like to be a guy walking with a hundred pound backpack down this road to get to the next camp where I was going to set up and start shooting at another guy. Isn't it interesting, though, the, the change in dynamic, though, for you? in that you're now putting yourself in the position of the soldier. Do you yes. put yourself in the position of the soldier? Yes. Oh, do you? Yes. And and what is that I, like? I think that's because I'm an American male who might actually have been there if I was 20 years older. You know? I mean, I, I mean j joke jokes, not jokes, like only half kidding, like that could have been me in that place with the guns and all of my compadres are shooting people because reasons, whatever, we don't need to get into it. And it's like, Oh my God, what's wrong with you, Wadman? Why aren't you also doing this? Don't you care about America? Aren't you scared by these people? You know, it's, I always put myself in the position of both people, both the person shooting and the person getting shot because, or at least I try to, um, imagine what it must have been like for those people because usually there are very few instances where morality is black and white you know it's just the world is a terrifying difficult place to be in and i don't know it's hard do you do you find i mean this has no people in it there's nothing moving because it was probably a four minute exposure or something yeah it's really long exposure do you do you feel well, by, by the way, can I just say there actually might have been people here? Yeah, they just might have been moving through too slowly to too quickly to, to be seen. But do you does it feel like humans are there to you? Or does that feel inanimate? It just seems extremely quiet, but then it seems quiet in the way it would seem when your ears have been deafened. Yeah. You know, at the, at the end of, at I the end wonder of about sound, just for a minute, I'm sorry, but you know, this has got the sound. It, it's, it's after the, the deafening noise. That it, I just imagine the insects and the wind and, you know, a similar thing here. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Well, because after the violence does come silence to some extent. There's a there's a amazing at the end of the First World War or the Great War as you call it. Um, I don't call it the Great War. Sorry. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it ended at eleven eleven on November eleventh or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And there is a 
seismograph recording of the front lines where for the last three minutes, both sides were like firing off guns and still bombing each other all the way up to the 11th minute of whatever it is. And there's a seismographic, you know, thing recording of the last thing and bang, 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 bang. And then just goes silent. Right. Mm -hmm. And somebody took that and recreated what the bombs would have sounded like and then having it stop. And then like 10 seconds later, birds start chirping that might've been around, you know, cause there's suddenly silence and echoing off the walls of, of, of the hills in the surrounding area. And it's funny because like, I'll listen to that. And it's like, I know this is a recreation, but it's based on this actual piece of evidence. And this actually makes it, makes me feel like I was there even more than photographs or footage of the first world war does, you know, in some ways, because I can imagine being a person there, you know, um, but I mean, the, this photograph, does it evoke a sense of place or a sense of? Well, I think that Crimea during that time and in that place during that war, I mean, this, you couldn't imagine a more barren thing. This could be the moon for all, for all intents and purposes. Yeah. But up to a point, the previous photograph might as well have been the moon. Sure. Um, I just want to. But there's, there's life in the other one. This one has like a little bit of grass, you know. Oh, I don't find life in the other one. I mean, those people are dead. No, it's not just that. It, uh, it's just, um, it has become so flat to me, that do, image. Do, do either, are either of them more haunting than the other to you? They're of equal... Haunt. ...capacity to haunt. Mm. Um, I, I just want to show you this. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the same ballpark, but it's a slightly different reason. Just, uh, you know, a 21st century. But does this mean anything? Well, this is, you know, we're looking at these photographs and because of the period in which they were made, we believe them mm -hmm. in whatever they're telling us or whatever we perceive them to be. Yep. Now, one of them is obviously and overtly politicized. The other, not so much, maybe. Depending on what way we look at things, we could say that this is, as you suggest, quiet. Some people might find this very noisy because it's still so full of violence because we can see the bodies. All those things we've kind of touched upon. In the 21st century, when we see photographs of war, I've really been thinking about whether we can trust them in as much as we could ever trust any image. This to me is bringing me up to the same, in a way, the same kind of fear I experience when I see the first image, not because of the nature of the visual element of the photograph, but because of what it means, which is that I might be persuaded to go to war by a lie. Sure, but that is nothing new. No, I know, but it just seems so... Well, um, I, I guess... Cowardly. You know, it's a little bit... Uh... There, as we've seen, have been photographs of war for 170 years. Yeah. It hasn't stopped war. So if somebody makes a whole bunch of fake images of war, is that actually going to be any different? I mean, there was a very famous photograph coming, it came out of the very first few months of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And it was when a maternity hospital had been hit and there was a pregnant woman being stretchered through the rubble, mm -hmm. a heavily pregnant woman. Uh, and I mean, Russia claimed that it was a fake image. Sure. Are you sure it wasn't? Maybe it was. Who, no. who, who, I'm, who, I'm not who saying was... this in any way. To I mean, no, but I, but at a certain point, then you have to start. You have to start trusting credit lines right you have to see that it was take it's a reuters photo or whatever it is 
you have to trust that Reuters is not going to screw you over. No, I know, but think about how much social sharing there is of imagery now. Sure, of course. Right, and we know, for example, that mothers were relying on footage of their dead sons appearing through friends' phones to try and identify where they might have fallen and go and retrieve their bodies. Now, I, I just want us to think on that, to take that in, that if we're sharing supposedly photographic images mm-hmm. because they're the most trustworthy form of evidence we have to believe in something that might have happened or is happening, yet we are enabling a tool all the time to just tell us lies. It is about whether we believe or not and how we, I guess, resolve these kind of um, specters for ourselves. These are ghosts, ghost images, and oh, they're very, they're so dangerous. Or is the, is, is the value of trusting our eyes or imagery now dead in the same way that we can't trust somebody's words? You know, Putin can get up and say, we're attacking Ukraine because we need to protect from those crazy Ukrainian Nazis or whatever the hell his line was at the beginning of the war. Yeah. If you trust Vladimir Putin, you know, you have to, you have to trust his words to trust him. He's got really nothing to back that up other than his words. Right. So, you know, is it going to be the same way with imagery where it's like, we're, we, we choose to believe the ones we want to believe. I'm just glad I'm not a war photographer. I'll tell you that. Well, I mean, McCullen, Sir Donald says, essentially, you never get over it. You can't. Yeah. And images come unbidden to your he mind. He also came to the conclusion that he didn't actually change anything at all. No, <laughs> and he doesn't want to be remembered as a war photographer. Yeah. yeah. What was the point of any of that? Yeah. In his words. Because it doesn't, it doesn't actually change anything. But this is, I think, something to, to consider. This was intended to change something. Yes, but was the original image intended to change or what the creation based on the image intended to change? Well, yes. The image, the image was intended to show a bunch of dead bodies from a massacre. It's well, only the well, text I mean- and the people who are using it for other purposes that are intending something with it. I do question why, um, I need to read more about this, but I do question why he took this photograph. As I said, it wasn't taken on the on the US military issue camera that he was supposed to use. It was taken on his personal camera. Sure. At the moment here, we've actually just got um, some, quite a few uh, different cases bubbling away in the background where um, laws are having to be changed around the spread and use of images that are in the classes and decent images or offensive. Mm. Uh, where, dome, That's the problem. Where, where people, for example, uh, you know, people who arrive at crime scenes, crash scenes, mm-hmm. murder scenes, suicide scenes, they make photographs of bodies or, and then they distribute them. They put them on Facebook. In fact, there was uh, an interview, BBC News. I was just reading it yesterday, actually. And it was a man at the Grenfell Tower disaster, you know, the, the building mm-hmm. went on fire in London, the cladding was unsafe and scores of people died in their homes. But there was a man who had found a, a body that emergency services dealing with so much else had wrapped quickly in plastic and had put in a courtyard just to put it somewhere. And he had approached the body taking photographs of it and then had moved the plastic away and had photographed the face of the of the deceased person you're saying he should not have been able to well he was sentenced to prison he was he had a prison sentence he was put in prison. but for 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 taking those pictures for disseminating them or for having you know messed with the crime scene for disseminating the images see but the flip side of that is what if your government starts telling you no nope, nothing happened here and you can't take pictures here and i mean that's the very american way of looking at it right like, no, no I, you can't stop it. me from doing that 
you know, this this is our conversation. We could spin this out for. I'm just going to change that image because it's just terrific. Um, look at me. I can't sit with that image on the screen for too long. Yeah. Uh, whereas this, ironically, you know, it just goes to show, doesn't it? This to me is is peaceful when it's not, but I I can have it there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Bill Wadman. What a sorry state we're in. Yeah, but I think we did a good job discussing this one. This one was interesting to me. You mean the others are not? What are you saying? No, this one was especially interesting to me. How about that? I like this one. Thanks. I think we dug into it. See you soon. Thanks. <laughs>